morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome back to um, our Mastermind Friday uh, Insane Productivity uh, call. And um, so I'm Jen Duplessis. I am speaking on behalf of or, you know, helping out with uh, Dave today. And um, I don't know if you know where he's at. I think he's in Baltimore. I think he's on the East Coast. He's with his son. So um, anyway, I just want to welcome everybody onto the call. And with me today, I also have Michelle Town. Good morning, Michelle. How are you doing today? Good morning, everybody. I am not on video today, but I'm all here for you. Awesome. I see, and you're at home. I hear your pups. I know, but I'm heading, I'm getting, you're going to hear me get in my car in just about two seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's summer, you know, and this is what happens in summer. But, you know, I just want to say thanks to everybody who's on. We appreciate you uh, coming here and showing up on, on Friday, you know, every Friday, and especially as we get into the summer months. Um, so I was talking with Dave, um, you know, this last week or so, and I had the, you know, great honor of um, spending a half a second with him. <laughs> Not very much time last week when we were at Mastermind Summit together. And one of the things that we thought we would do today is to review what, you know, we learned at Mastermind Summit. And um, so I'd like to ask everyone who's on the call, you know, if you were at Mastermind Summit um, to raise your hand because we'd like to hear what you took away. What are your best takeaways from um, the summit last week? And, and of course, we're also piggybacking on some of the conversation that uh, Dave had with Tim uh, Brahim several weeks ago, uh, you know, Tim was at the event um, and he drew a crowd as usual. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to share some of the things that, that, um, that I learned that Dave learned. Uh, Michelle, I, I know you didn't go, but I'm sure that you'll have something to say about um, some of the comments I'm going to make about what I learned so we can expand on that as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm but I want to remind excited. everybody. Yeah. I'm very excited oh, to gosh, hear about you know, it because I missed it. Yeah. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. So um, before we do that, I just want to remind everybody um, that we are live on Facebook. So if you're in Facebook and you have a question, um, please feel free to, to ask us a question and, and we'll try to address it um, in the next hour that we're talking here. Um, we want to remind you again, it's a mastermind group. So um, Michelle and I don't want to be talking this whole time. We'd like to hear from you as well. And um, last but not least, um, the Script Palooza, we've updated the um, lead conversion workbook. So you'll find that on our Facebook page, on our group Facebook page, along with um, a link to it as well. There's a, there's a comment about it, and then there's a couple of different links because people were asking questions. So make sure you get in there and make sure that you see the updates that we put in there for you as well. Um, Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to get started. I have a ton of notes. I've, I've compiled them into more, you know, I learned a lot, um, but there's a, some highlighted things that I think are um, really important to talk about. And, you know, see, it's, it's odd because even though we're all together as a mastermind group on Fridays, we are also um, part of a bigger community, and it's amazing um, that this big community is all pulling together right now to help one another um, with uh, it. Believe me, I heard over and over and over price compression, uh, competition. Uh, how do we uh, communicate and create better relationships with realtors, you know, our realtor partners. Um, and there was just a lot of ideas around it. Um, and I just want to kind of spit them out here as we go along. So as I do this, Michelle, I'd like to get your feedback um, on each one of them. That, would that be okay? For sure. I'm happy to help. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so one of the things, um, you know, and, and so there were a lot of panels. There were a lot of, you know, mega, mega, mega producers. There was um, – uh, one guy, and I don't remember everybody's names, so I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have everyone's names. Um, doing about 600 million a year. Um, he's an ex-baseball player, um, so I don't know if that notoriety helps. But um, anyway, he said he said something about um, the call, the call that you're making with realtors, whether you're in person or um, on the phone with them, and he calls it a level four relationship. So one of the things that I wanted to share with you. Is, is that so when you call a realtor and they um, and you're asking to do business with them or you're in front of them and they're asking um, them to do business we already know that they have a few canned responses you know which is 
One is I got a guy, right? That's a level one relationship with a realtor. They say they have a guy and you kind of walk away. Two is, you know, my guy that I have, he gets stuff done and he gets it done in a very timely manner. And I always know that the loan's going to go to closing. And so those become more difficult for us to overcome because one, they have a guy, two, they do a great job. The third part of that in level three is that he makes or that he co-markets with them. So whether it's on Zillow or whatnot, he co-markets with them. And so that makes it even more difficult for us to overcome um, that challenge of getting in front of them, right? But then what this particular loan officer said is, um, I ask them, do they have a level four relationship? Um, and that relationship is the loan officer who gives the real estate agent referrals and so he said um he said that when he's talking to people you know if he says you know do you have a relationship i'd love to have a relationship with you i'd like to meet with you for coffee whatnot and they say i got a guy or my guy does a really good job or yeah i'd be interested in a relationship with you if you co-market with me he just goes right into well how would you um would you be interested in a level four relationship understanding that they don't know these levels anyway. So he just says, are you interested in a level four relationship, which is a relationship of being a partnership. Um, and I just, I don't know why that that, I mean, I do know why that really struck me as something different. It, it struck me as saying, you know, that's great that you have a guy and he gets the job done. He co-markets with you, but I want to do something even better. I want to have a partnership with you and provide you with referrals because we know that a lot of times the they got the guy the getting it done and the co-marketing that person is not always giving referrals back to the realtor and they don't necessarily recognize that so we have to shine a light on the fact that that's not happening so i thought that was one good thing about a level four relationship so michelle do you have any comments about that I think that's great. And um, I've never heard it put as a level four. So I love that because that kind of helps put things in priority. For me, I like, I use my A and B realtors, but a level four would be somebody that would get all my attention and first in, first out, as far as I'm concerned with me. But I agree. We have so many realtors right now that are, they're struggling just like we are, you guys. And they're trying, they, they need our, our expertise because We've been doing this for years on going in, mining to them, helping them, and they're not used to it when we don't, when they're, you know, when there's no inventory or not as used to the level that we're doing. But one of the things I run into is a lot of realtors say, well, I want you to, um, you know, spend money with me right now. And I'm, I'll be like, we can't do that right now, but I can certainly spend time with you because that is probably more valuable. And we can then dig into your databases or, we can hand you leads back and we can work as a true partnership. And I think that's one of the things that I'm seeing come very true with all the Facebook marketing. A lot of the um, people out here are becoming more creative and offering to do social media for the realtor because they're not set up for it. And we already have our staff that's doing it um, so that they can, we can show a value in another way other than a dollar, a, a dollar sign. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, it totally does. And I, I think that you bring up a really good point is that um, I was just on uh, recording a podcast, you know, for my podcast yesterday, and I was talking to a train a coach for realtors. And she said that their number one problem, and she had just had the, the call yesterday, their number one problem across the board with all of them was lack of knowledge in um in how to market themselves properly, because they all, they all know the standard things, but they're they're just not getting what we all here are getting. You know, they're they're not getting that. So if we can start showing them different ways to market um, in social media, how to target an audience, right? You know, like Bill Hillstead shows us um, how to target a mar uh, an audience. If we can show them that, um, we're going to really have a great partnership with them and show bring a lot of value to the relationship. But the other part interestingly enough was, um, and I was pretty surprised by this, is that um, they don't know our products. And they were all talking about the fact that um, they, they would love to hear more about products. And I was really stunned by that yesterday because 
uh, you know, we try to, especially in our community, right? We try to uh, not talk specifically about products, but about, you know, the structure for our families and how we can help them realize wealth over the period of time that they, they're owning their home. And um, the realtors are actually looking for, maybe it's that they're looking for more um, shiny objects to try to sell more homes. So they, you know, are saying, hey, I want to know about the renovation loan. I want to know that there's a doctor loan out there. Um, and that, you know, the variations of doctor loans. So I thought that was pretty interesting as well. So, you know, it's up to us to take these relationships to the fourth level and not just be the servant um, to, the, to the transaction, but take this relationship even further to be the coach. And of course, we've all been talking about that for weeks and weeks, right? Um, but it just was brought to light in a different way. And I thought I'd share that. So hopefully everybody liked that. Um, any more comments on that, Michelle, or do you want me to go on to the next one? Well, I'd love to comment just on, you know, tying in Darren Hardy here. So on Tuesday, his, um, his morning um, daily, daily Darren was all about outsourcing your weaknesses. And I think if you present that to your realtors and maybe not call it their weakness, but something they haven't grown on, that's what he talked about um, on that um, Tuesday call, the Tuesday recording. It was pretty incredible of, you know, pick the thing that you're strong at and do the same thing with your realtors when you're meeting at them. You, you know, hey, you guys should be out there selling. You guys should be out there doing this. Why don't you let us outsource to the stuff that you're, that's not your best use of your time or that you don't have the staff to do because most realtors might have a TC, but they don't have somebody that's actually going to do their marketing unless they're in a bigger group. And whereas some of, some of the mortgage professionals, we usually are working on teams now because we found how successful it is. And I think the realtors are going to come around soon and realize how successful it is by spending a little bit of extra money to have more time to do the stuff they're good at. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. As you know, um, we talk about the partnership, but perhaps we could even expand on that and say, you know, my partnership is to be an outsource for you and, you know, to help your business grow in whatever way I can. And, and I know a lot of us are now, you know, approaching realtors about doing some of their calls into their database. You know, I call it boomerang buyers, you know, as to get the, the buyers to come back to us and, I think that's a really good point um, as well as is, is uh, talking about perhaps the outsourcing is, you know, as a means to help continue to coach them. So thank you for that. That's really great. Um, okay. So let me just, I mean, I'm going to kind of be all over the place here because there was different people doing different things. One, one realtor or loan officer is in Colorado. Um, she does, her practice is a little over a hundred million a year. And, um, she was talking about client appreciation parties um, or events. And one of the things that I thought that was really interesting about this, and, and um, maybe it's just because I do think I may do it different than she does, and you may already do it this way, but when I have a client appreciation party, I usually, or event, I usually invite my favorite people. I don't invite my entire database because, you know, after, 35 years, I've got um, a little over 10,000 people in my database. Um, so I don't invite 10,000 people to come to the event because I'm so afraid they're going to show up. And that's what she said, too. She said, I wasn't doing that at first. I, I was so afraid and then nobody would show up. So she now invites her entire database to a client event. And one of the things that I thought that was so interesting about this is that um, her events, she has a database of around 4,500 people. And she has around 200 to 300 people come to each event. So you want to make sure that, you know, that's the event that you're, you're trying to pull people in. Um, but she said the thing that was so interesting is that the non-attendees, those that said no, um, are actually the best leads because, because they uh, can't make it, they feel bad. <laughs> and this is what she was saying. Because they can't make it. Um, that jogs them to say, hey, you know what, now that I have you on the phone, I have a friend, or now that I have you on, a on the phone, I'd like to refinance, or I'm thinking about buying or selling. And um, she was saying, you know, the invite means more than them actually, you know, the event itself, and it pulls them into your circle, your inner circle, and 
that's where leads and business and referrals happen is inside that inner circle once they get to know you really well. So I thought that was kind of an interesting um, concept. And so she was talking about, she spent $700 doing a film, um, sponsoring a film festival in Boulder, Colorado. And um, she invited all of her clients to that event to help promote the event as well. And from that specific event, she closed 23 loans. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, there's a couple of takeaways there. One, invite everybody, bring them into your circle um, and realize that it's the invite that means more than the actual event itself. We focus so much on, um, you know, the number of people that show the results instead of the lead indicators, right? So thoughts on that, Michelle? I love that. First of all, the guilt factor always is a good way to, you know, have people <laughs> feel <laughs> obligated. But I mean, you'd be surprised. I mean, sometimes, you know, reaching, and this is probably why we stress over and over in this mastermind group, um, working your database, um, regardless if it's an event, regardless if it's a, you know, happy birthday card, regardless if it's, you know, um, a hey, just checking in. It's so important because those lead sources have referrals that they're wanting to give to you. They just don't know how to give them to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes they forget about us, and we have to make sure that we're jogging the memories. You know, and that's that's part of it too. You know, I, I would say that the the common thread throughout the entire mastermind and i'm also going to talk about mortgage revolution that i attended afterwards and then subsequently something called momentify everything starts with an m momentify in, in orlando this all in this last 10 days or so um that common thread was about your database and about the importance of um making sure that uh, and I think we addressed this in a couple weeks ago as well, is that um, for this next, and I think you did, Michelle, the next refi boom, we need to be um, nurturing and pulling our, our relationships closer to us so that we're prepared for the next refi boom, you know, in the next couple of years or so. So we have this opportunity. And if we don't take it now, we may find ourselves in a really bad situation a couple of years from now. So definitely a big thread um, through that. Um, so the other thing was personalization, uh, personalizing and customizing things versus mass and bulk, right? So mass emails, bulk emails seem to be the thing of the past. Um, and that was resonated with several different speakers at several different times, um, in several industries, ironically. So, um, there wasn't always just a loan officer speaking or, you know, a, um, a Barry Habib or whatever. And so that seemed to be something that everyone's talking about is personalization of everything, even down to your texts, you know, not doing mass texts or bulk texts or any, anything like that. Um, and, and I thought, you know, again, it resonated with me because it is all about these personal relationships that we're having people um, with people. And I think that's extremely important. Um, so uh, it was funny, Michael Mayer was there, um, the author of Seven Levels of Communication, and he said, you know, if you use the word mass or bulk, um, fire yourself. You need to be personalizing and customizing. So I thought that was very interesting as well. I mean, some of these things are things that we know, of course, right? But I, I think it's just good to have them reiterated so that... Um, you know, we're aware of moving forward and, and it's hard when it's a scalable situation, you know, because it is easier to do mass and bulk, but um, I thought that was really interesting as well. So any thoughts on that, Michelle? Yes, yeah, so I, I will tell you that I, um, I noticed that my individual emails are opened more than my mass emails. I would love to tell you that I can't, I, I can't personalize everything. We've, we've worked with Jingo and now it kind of looks like it part, it's personalized because we grab some information from the data that's in, um, in Jingo and actually put it in our subject line so it's more personal for the client. Those seem to be working a little bit better. Um, um, it's just tough. It's finding, you know, your right, right target, right message. I, I think that's so important and the right subject line. 
you know, do you want to open it up? We just, I just did a really mini one to just my clients, not any of my leads or whatever of, you know, what does the, um, I use the, um, um, the uh, mail, not mail, the, sorry, my brain is stopped. The new feed from um, the iPhone on um, the 15, the, the rate hike, sorry about that. Um, so the rate hike, and I sent that out to my, you know, 400 client database, and I got a pretty nice opening on that one, and we customized it. We're like, we said, hey, and then we inserted their name, John, what does the rate hike mean for you? Um, so that it looks a little bit more personal, although we ended up being able to do it in a bulk type situation. Yeah. So I think that's, I think that's a key thing. So if you're just going to do mass and bulk, you know, um, sharing something or inviting people and you don't have that personalization in there, that's, uh, that's what they were talking about is not sending out 3000 personalized um, emails, but personalizing um, the email itself, you know, if that's what you're doing or your slide dial or, or whatever, you know, as, as best you can. Um, so I did just, again, I mean, these, these are things that we just, that I heard that, that uh, were something that was not just in one setting, but it was across all conversations. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, take it, take that for what it is. Hey, listen, there's a question. Um, that we have, and um, it's from Lor Lorkin. I'm so sorry if I, or Lorson, Lucy, I'm sorry if I messed up your name, <laughs> Lorkin. Um, so anyway, they want to know um, how, how to do it all. Do you outsource your database? She said Orkin, Orkin, or he said Orkin, okay. Um, outsource your database management, or do you have an assistant doing this, the database management? So Michelle, do you want to go ahead and address that um, as far as your database management? To sure. what extent I you're have, doing versus your team? Sure. I have a, um, an assistant that manages my database, um, um, manages the day-to-day -day stuff. And we have, you know, automatic reminders and automatic set fields that remind us what to do. So we try to put, we try to keep it as organized as possible because um, we're managing, I'm managing a, a database of like 25,000. So it's pretty huge. So we're starting to actually wheedle some of those out so that we can have it as a more manageable database. But I am, um, in, I am in the process of outsourcing every single social media stuff. Um, I am not good at it. My assistant doesn't have time to do it. And we do need to keep our presence there. So I outsource that. I don't, but my database, I manage myself right now. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a freak of my data getting out to anybody else. So um, I keep it close to the vest right now. Um, I don't know that it will change because I've had several calls from several companies that are willing to manage the database and we're starting to question whether if you know putting that money into them and letting my assistant do more um quality stuff would be better and um that's something we're going to be discussing in our our at quarter end meeting yeah yeah that's interesting so if anyone else has any thoughts on that um, to help answer this question you know raise your hand because we'd love to bring you in um you know into the mastermind and share um, some of this information as well. So thank you so much for, for that um, question. And thank you so much, Michelle, for answering that. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so, so a few other things. Um, was a lot of talk about us building a platform for leads to find us and call us so that we can dish them out to our referral partners. A lot of discussion about that, about um, us doing uh, client, um, I hate the word cultivation, <laughs> acquisition, us doing client acquisition on our own. Um, I heard, and I believe we've discussed this the last several weeks or so on this call is um, NAR just came out their new uh, statistic about realtors, 82% of them will not, will fail in the first year. That means that 8.2% of the realtors you're speaking to who are in the first year are going to fail at being a realtor unless we can help train them and be the outsource for them as well. And so everyone was saying, you know, then why are we relying on people that um, most likely aren't going to make it, right? So why not go out and do our own client acquisition and create a platform to do that? And um, Michelle, you just spoke to the fact about um, 
about your um, social media. And I know that everyone's really working on that, at least in our community, right? Uh, to ensure that we we're getting um, the exposure we need to cultivate more relationships and more um, more clients. But that was something that was mentioned as well is, is the need to build any type of platform that we can so that we can do our own lead generation and then pass that on to our um, our partners. Now, I have to tell you, it's not something I've done from the social media standpoint. It's something I've done um, through lunch and learns, through um, contacting HR or payroll at, at a borrower's company, you know, um, my borrower's employer. And that seems to work really well for me, but I'd like to know what everybody else is doing to uh, manifest this as we're in this situation where there's just not as much business floating around out there. So if you have some ideas on it, I'd love to ha hear what you have to say, Michelle. I, I, I chose a different method um, of advertising this year. And I'm happy to share what I'm doing. Um, I don't know how it's gonna help the purchase business, but it is actually helping my realtors as well. Um, I am actually, I went back to the radio. So I look at where is everybody advertising and where is everybody not advertising? I went, so I wanna look at where, where can I fill that gap that's missing? Um, because I'm not, I'm not as, I'm not great on social media. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't think I log on to Facebook except for you know once a month, maybe. It's awful. But I needed to go to something that I'm high. You know, it's, it's a high cost, and I knew it was going to be a high cost. It was a big risk, but it certainly paid off for me. And I've done even though my ads are geared. My ads are not geared specifically to refinances. They're geared towards the my product, what I'm known for. I'm known for the out of the box stuff, and mm -hmm. I. I get purchase leads. I just sent over a purchase, a listing um, to one of my agents because the client's moving to Texas and um, he needed help structuring his loan to get to Texas. So we did that. And now he's selling his house and he's going, I gave it to one of my realtors. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I don't know if I have any lunch and learns are great. Social media is going to be great. I know a friend of mine that's doing that right now and he's killing it. I mean, killing it with geo-targeting, um, finding the right avenues, advertising his agents' open houses on Facebook, capturing the uh, client's information, giving it back to the realtor, saying, hey, just so you know, we had 200 hits on your open house. Here are all the names and um, whatever data they can give them. So I think that that has been incredible. I just don't know how to do that. So I would have to hire somebody to do that. Did I answer the question? Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think, I think we all do something a little different. I, I do think that this is something that um, next year at Mastermind, this is going to be, I feel, one of the biggest topics that we're going to have next year. Um, I was a little disappointed that there wasn't as much social media um, discussion as I thought there would be this year, given what we've been talking about in our mastermind group here. Um, but that's okay. Cause that means we're ahead of the game. Right. <laughs> so, but I do think that's going to be next year um, coming up. So I, I, um, so think, I would just say, think about it, you know, think about ways that you could cult cultivate the referrals yourself and give them back to other people. I think that's going to be really critical. Um, I just do. I, it's just coming up more and more and more. Um, so, okay. So Monica um, just said, I'd like to know more about geo-targeting on Facebook. Um, on Facebook. Um, is that the Bill Hillstead thing? And yes, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> it is. Um, I, Michelle, you, you're working with Bill, correct? Um, I am not yet. Um, we actually have our first um, look at um, our stuff next. It, in July, I had to wait. My sister's getting married, so I didn't want to do anything until after the wedding in July. Yeah. Yeah, I'm working with Bill. Um, we're knee deep in. We're a couple of months in now. And um, yeah, the geo-targeting, Monica, um, you know, it's pretty extensive um, with the audiences. So you have to really be, and this kind of goes into our next topic. You have to be very specific about who your client is um, because there's just so many people. Here, let me give you an example. I, 
I think I had like 2,800, maybe 3,000 friends on Facebook. In a matter of four days, I had maxed out at 5,000. I didn't know you could max out friends on Facebook. Apparently you can. And then once you max out, you now have to go to a page. You can't have friends under the personal piece. Now, once you get to the page, you can have millions and millions of friends. So the first step is really targeting the right people. And it's amazing what Facebook can do for targeting um, the, you know, either location, likes, um, and I don't mean likes like that, meaning um, I went to Colorado State University. So for me, I wanted anybody who went to Colorado State University so I could have that camaraderie, right? But you want to, and then we drew, um, ironed that down into um, how much money they make. Um, how much money does the person make, whether they own their home or don't own the home, whether they're looking for um, searching for things about credit online. It's amazing how you can drive that down. And so what I ended up getting was going from whatever number to 5,000, but that difference was now my tribe, right? The people that are, are looking for the things that I'm, I'm looking to provide. Um, so yeah, that's what it does. And, um, so get, get, uh, Bill's smart sheet that he provided to us. We'll go ahead and repost that. Oh, Marcy, you can remember that for us. Um, we'll go ahead and repost that so you can see the link there because you can self-train yourself. You don't have to hire Bill if you don't want to. Um, you definitely can, can get the information from him. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's, that's good. Oh, and so Nolan just said income demographics is going away on Facebook. So if it's going away, uh, get it quickly because I, thankfully I already got it. Um, but that's just one feature. There's thousands and thousands of features. So that takes us into the next thing um, that I had to really work on with Bill and was brought up at, at this event. So there was a loan officer there who closes 468, um, or, loans them a year or takes care of 468 families. And um, the phrase that was used, and I believe I've heard it before, is you have to niche to grow rich. Um, so 468 loans, every one of them was renovation loan, every single one of them. And now I have to tell you, I was sitting there thinking, wow, I mean, I talk about renovation loans. I've, I've certainly done a lot of 203Ks, but I've never made it a niche. You know, I've gone out and I've sort of solicited it. People know I do it, but this guy has made it his life's lesson to go after renovation only loans, period, end of story. And he did 468 of them last year. Um, so less is really more. And when we're talking about this Facebook piece of this, um, really identifying your um, your target market is really key. Now, I know, Michelle, you've mentioned this several times. You've got a very special niche, and that's really one of the things that has made you so successful in this industry. So would you mind talking a little bit about your niche for those people that haven't heard it before and why you felt that going into a niche was um, much more profitable? Absolutely. Um, I Everybody needs to, I mean, everybody, the, the challenge of going into your niche is they forget that you do the other things. That's where I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how people go, but I still do the Fanny and Freddie. They go, well, I thought you only do the jumbo out of the box stuff. So be careful how you market because that, I, I marketed very well on my out of the box. So now I'm, I'm re, we're rebranding a little bit and making sure that everybody knows, hey, we still do the VA loans. We still do that. But um about two years ago, or about, I guess it was a year and a half ago, I started watching our market shift a little bit, and we started getting into the, the Quicken loans, um, the loan depots, the, the automated of the, here I'm going to give you a pre-approval without ever talking to somebody with you putting data in, and um, I'm the type of person who needs to be needed. And what I was finding, and it could have been because I was very heavily into Zillow as well, when you work in internet leads, your value is how cheap you are, and your value didn't, doesn't bring into your knowledge base. So mm -hmm. I did a little bit of soul searching for six months and decided that, you know, I had gotten into this business in 89. I didn't become an originator until 2000, at end of 2007 and how I made my name for myself was being out of the box. So I went back to what, I, what my roots were, 
and um, just really dove into the bank statement programs, the one-year tax return programs, the um, cross-collateral loans, um, the loans that I knew that there was a need for because there's 60% of our population that fit into that box, right? But there's 40% that don't. And those 40%, when I looked at the demographics, were usually higher-end, self-employed borrowers. Um, and so I changed my model. And it was a struggle for six months um, you know, because I didn't, I didn't know my product as well as I did. But I'm a big understand your product before you sell it. So I just really dove in for six months and really knew my product. But that's what I did for me because I need, I know I need to be needed. And that's important to me. I, 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 this whole rate thing, it drives me crazy. It's like, I, if I, I was, I, this is one of my lines that I use with people. If I was to tell you your rate was 10%, but your payment was 2,500, or tell your rate was 1%, but your payment was 2,500, which one would you take? And everybody always says the 1%. I go, fantastic. Right. Then let's just talk about the payment. Um, because it doesn't matter what that number says on the rate. And with our, you know, how much government control that's in here, I just tell people, it doesn't matter if I sell you a 1% rate or a 10% rate. I make the same amount of money. So I'm not benefiting. You're the only one that's going to benefit from listening to what I have to tell you. Let's make sure that this is the right thing for you. And that's when that out-of-the-box stuff comes in. The interest only are becoming very big again. And um, the 40-year terms are becoming very big. So I would probably, if I was to give any suggestion to anybody, is go to whichever mortgage company you work with, find that one product that you love, learn it, and go sell it and tell people about it. And that's what I was, I was successful. The radio helped me get it across, but also all of my print marketing, all of my agent calls, everything was all focused on those out of the box stuff. And, um, and it's been pretty successful for me over the last 18 months. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, I do think that's key. I mean, we, I mean, the way I always use the example is, you know, driving down the road about getting, you know, if you had to get gas in your car and you have 7-Eleven and you have Sheets, which is on the East Coast, just so everybody knows, <laughs> um, and you have just a generic gas station. And if you're in the mood for coffee, you're going to go to Sheets because they have great coffee. And if you're in the mood for a sloop, Slurpee, you're going to go to 7-Eleven. If none of them had that, then it's all, then the choice then becomes who has the best price because it could be that just because I want a Slurpee, and 7-Eleven's more expensive. I don't want to go to get my Slurpee and then go to the cheap bank. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go pay a little bit more premium because that's what they specialize in, right? And um, and I think that, that that's really true. And, you know, in my practice, I've done that too, um, where my three specialties are VA, Jumbo, and investor loans. And I've done a lot of investor loans. That's, that's the biggest bulk of my business um, is really focusing on the investor and really understanding um, what their needs are. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the out of the box because see with investors, it's not about the rate either. It's um, about the numbers working, um, the payment, right? The numbers have to work and the cash flow has to work. So I really believe in that as well. Um, there was a lot of thought about that. Um, and, and in fact, there were a lot of questions in audiences saying, you know, what do you, what do you focus on, et cetera. There's another person that um, all they do is FHA loans. They market that way. They don't do conventional at all, um, and they're just known as the expert for v, uh, FHA loans. So, you know, I would just say find something that you're passionate about and, and go forward with it um, rather than being the commodity. Um, so anyway, so that's good. Um, so listen, we, we have some... Um, Linnea, Linnea, Clayton, sorry, Linnea, said that there is a six-hour social media marketing specialization certification from Northwestern University being offered through Coursera. So um, that's spelled C-O-U-R-S-E, Coursera.org, Coursera.org. So if you have interest in going to a, um, a six, there's a six-course social media specialization certification. So if that's cool, you know, if you want to do something like that, thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so um, the niche was really cool. Um, here's another thing as we're talking about um, radio and social media and things like that. Someone had mentioned four uh, the four Ds of, and I didn't pick it up, so the four Ds of something, um, but it was daily digital deep dive. 
And I thought that was really cool. And he said, take one topic, you know, you get a question from a realtor or another referral partner or a client, you get a question, take that one topic and um, blow it up on social media. And here's how he said to do it. He said, take the topic and do a 20 minute YouTube to really answer the question, you know, and put that on YouTube for 20 minutes and then dissect it into a couple more different segments on Facebook doing a one minute video and then dissect it even further or duplicate it on Instagram. And um, he said, for those of you that have podcasts, you know, to do a 10 or 20 minute podcast as well. So taking that one topic and, and then spreading it across all social media, but in different ways and different timelines, um, rather than just doing one thing and then just sort of casting it across there, because what ends up happening is that um, they see that same video in the different, um, the different media, um, social media outlets. And this way you can take that topic and answer it a little differently in different media. And I thought that was really, really cool because, you know, if you're sitting and doing a video, um, it's really easy, you know, to hang up your phone. I mean, I have my office set up so that if I hang up the phone and I got a really good question that I want to share, I can immediately just turn on Zoom is what I, what I use, turn on Zoom and answer the question. But I've just answered the question and then sort of posted it on Facebook. And now I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll answer the question one way and then answer, you know, expand on it someplace else. So, um, and I, and I thought from a time perspective, if we're talking about our, you know, our productivity here, um, if I'm on the subject, I might as well be on the subject in, you know, two or three different videos, different ways. And I can post them across different, different medias that have a different look and feel so that everyone doesn't think it's, I'm saying the same thing. They might want to listen more. So I really like this daily digital deep dive, um, to just every day, take one topic and deep dive with it and spread it across all the media that you use. So thoughts on that, Michelle? I love that. Um, I, do too. I love that a lot. <laughs> I love that a lot. And I like the fact that you, how cool is that? So I've always wanted to do, don't laugh, the Michelle's Mortgage Minute. Um, that's been my like goal to do. And I've been failing at that one thing to do. And if I would just get a Zoom and, and sit there and do Michelle's Mortgage Minute, like when something unique comes up, I can do a, did you know that this, and then have it recorded and send it out to my fiber guys and have them just blast it out. Yeah. Um, I'm writing, I've written that one down. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally, I think it's cool. I do th something called Jen's jots. That's what I Love do. It. I don't have M for mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so I thought that was really cool. I thought that was something that, you know, we could expand on and, and talk about, um, you know, as well. And then, um, so, so, uh, one last thing from, from, uh, mastermind and, and mortgage revolution. And I've kind of combined all these things as we've gone along. So if, if for those of you that don't know what mortgage revolution is, it's, um, short for that is MREV and, um, all the proceeds go to a charity, a local charity, which, you know, is really cool. And um, there's about, um, I'd say there's 80 people there. It's a smaller mastermind. Um, it's really what I call a mortgage TED Talk. Um, and there was about, uh, I think, 16 or 17 of us speakers. We're all loan officers. And we get up and we have 10 minutes to talk about one idea. It's called Just the Tip, hashtag Just the Tip. So if you want to go find that, you can, hashtag Just the Tip. We just give one tip that's working for us in our practice, you know, and then you're off the stage and then the next person's on and it's just plethora of ideas all day long. Um, and now we're talking about having one of those on the East Coast too. So I'm excited about doing that. But one of the things that they said, you're all going to die laughing when you hear about this. Um, so one of the loan officers has a passion for birds. And she started taking pictures of birds. You know, anytime she saw a bird, she'd take a picture of a bird. Amazing thing. Her average loan, her, she was closing an average of seven loans a month. And in a course of a little over 120 days, she's now closing an average of 12 loans a month just because she takes pictures of birds and puts them on the website, on her, on her not website, but on her Facebook page and Instagram. The, she said that she specifically targets her realtors to try to get them into her circle to understand what her um, what her passion is. And she said, 
I, she said, it's just the silliest thing. I started doing something that was a passion of mine and I get responses and, Hey, by the way, I have a client for you. Um, I think that's so cool. I like birds. Can I meet with you? And she was able in that 120, I think it was like 126 days that she measured it. Um, she's now, she hired a, her first LOA, her first loan officer assistant, and she's on her way. And I said, well, you know, it's just crazy, but I, I want to share every idea, you know, all the ideas that people had, um, because maybe there's a passion that you have that you want to share with people. And, you know, whether it's birds or bugs or cars or, or whatever, um, it gets the engagement going. And, and that's, instead of us just always talking, this is an opportunity to sort of mix it up and put little photos in there of things that we love. And um, so I just want to share that one as well. It's kind of like for you, Michelle, just take pictures of all your horses, you know? Right. I know. And people will start talking about it. And I'm sure they do already. That's the one thing, the personal thing that I allow into the, like, not allow, but to try to help me start connecting with people. I always run, run in that, you know, that I have horses and I'm an avid rescuer of horses. And it usually opens up the conversation and um, creates a balance. You'd be surprised how many people have either ridden a horse, loved horses, or oh my God, I, I would never go near them because they scare me to death. And I'll go, oh, they're yeah. not so scary. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. No, I think that's good. And so it's just anything to connect, you know. So I want to make sure everybody knew, you know, while we are heading to videos, there's an opportunity for us to stay with photos if that's an engagement piece. Um, okay. So down in Orlando, um, I learned something else learned the value of a client. And I think this is really key. And I just want to share this with everybody too. Um, you know, I think that a lot of times we think the value of a client is um, how much we're going to make from that one transaction. We obviously know that over time we hope to do more loans, but there was a system that showed us um, how to calculate it. And so I'm going to give you sort of the formula to do it. And the value of a client is um, what your average your average um, commission is per loan, okay? Well, your average is not, not your percentage, but what your average is based on your average loan amount, the number of clients that you have in your database. So that's something you need to consider as well. And so right now the average um, person is holding their mortgage for seven years and they're living in their home for 10. So the thought here is, is that at seven years, you'll have the opportunity to do a refinance. At 10 years, you'll have the opportunity to do another loan for when they buy a new home. And then every client in your database will refer you one person per year. Now, obviously, you've got to have a strategy, right, to put this in play with your manual reviews and all the other touches that you do. But the thought there is that, that you would have at least um, one referral a year. And we looked at a period of 20 years, okay? So that'd be 20 loans plus one, I mean, 20 uh, referrals to other people, plus uh, one refinance and one purchase just from that one client. So the average client then becomes, in this, in this uh, scenario that we ran, for example, is um, $33,000. So they're not the you know, X amount that you're making per transaction, but they're the $33,000 over the life. And so we talk about that client for life, or you know, I'm gonna be your lender for life. This is what we're talking about, that each client is worth approximately $33,000, 33 and change for this example. And this person had um, 240 people in their database, small, you know, smaller database, which is fine. That equates to $2.5 million over that 20 years. So that with your, all your clients. So when you look at your practice as one loan, then the next loan, you know, $2,500 here, $1,800 there, $6,000 there. It's better to look at your loan as or your whole practice as it's a $2.5 million practice over that 20 years with this 240 person database. Okay. Now, obviously that's scalable, right? But then what I, I injected in the meeting and I said, well, what if you could get one referral from every client who's in process in addition to one referral per year from that client? And it took that same practice from a $2.5 million practice to a $6 million practice. And I'm really talking about 240 people in a database. That's it. That's it. So that's one year of work, really. So think about how that grows over a period of time that you're in the industry and how, what the real true value of your, your practice is. Um, 
so thinking about the value of every client, and I think we need to do a deep dive on this for one of our Friday calls, because I think this is really, really important so that we're not looking at what's in front of us, but we're looking at what the whole future is for our practice. So thoughts on that, Michelle? I agree 100%. I think we become so transactional focused that we forget the transactions behind the one we just closed. And um, it's, again, same thing. Database is your gold mine. I mean, a lot of people don't spend any money on advertising because they just mine their database and they mine it well. Yeah. So that's, and that was the whole point. And again, when I was saying this thread about your database across all lines is that here we are again, talking about the importance of your database. And when we talk about productivity, instead of going on and chasing more and more and more, we just maybe need to look at what we have in our own pocket now and see what we can get from that. And, and anyway, so I thought, I thought that was really cool. So, you know, if you've got 10,000, 20,000 people in your database, we're not talking about $6 million practice. We're talking about many, 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 many millions and millions of dollars in your practice that are invested if you play it right, you know. So hopefully we'll do a deep dive on, on that. Um, the last thing, because we're getting close to the top of the hour here, and if anybody has any more questions, please let me know. Um, the last thing that was brought up that I thought was really interesting, and it had to do with Quicken, about the fact that, you know, the, the speed of loans and the ease and everything. And we were talking primarily about the client experience. And that's something that we do a lot here in our, in our productivity um, group is, um, you know, the McDonald's. So he was talking about the McDonald's experience versus sort of the Capitol Grill. So if, hopefully everybody knows what that is. It's just more high end. You would not take, or at least you would hope, or I mean, if my husband's watching, I'll tell him, you don't take me to McDonald's for our anniversary, right? <laughs> we don't go to McDonald's for our anniversary. We go to the Capitol Grill, and that has a different experience and a different price point, right? If you want McDonald's experience, usually that's on the road. It's quick. It's fast. There's not a high level of experience that you would get by going to the Capitol Grill, and that's what Quicken is what he was addressing and saying, so if you want the quick, fast, low experience, go to Quicken. But if you want the anniversary experience, you know, the experience um, that ha that's memorable, that, um, you know, will have lasting results, then you want to go to something like a Capitol Grill because, and that's us, right? And so he was saying, you know, what kind of experience do you want to give to clients and some people I understand, you know, do Zillow and, and buy leads and, and really churn and burn. But I think everyone in this group, you know, we're trying to have, even with that, we're trying to have great experiences for our clients. And um, so he said, uh, make sure you know what you do for people and who you want to attract. This gets back to niche to grow rich, right? Don't just attract everybody if you want if you want McDonald's people and you want Quicken people, or do you want people who are, are looking for more of the Capitol Grill or something in between? You know, maybe it's a buffet. I don't know. But who do you want to serve and, you know, who do you want to attract and build your perfect loan process and your, you know, um, the entire experience when you and your team around um, who you're trying to attract. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, is, again, another take on what we're talking, we are all talking about here um, that, you know, we're not always a good fit for everybody. And I think that it's important to express that to our clients that, you know, we're not always a good fit. And before we, um, you know, go down the path of spending time together uh, with assessing, you know, comprehensive plan, um, a long term commitment or, you know, time in helping them make a decision that we ask for a commitment from them and that we assess whether or not this really is a client that we want to serve. Um, and uh, really asking, you know, can I get that commitment for you to work with me given the fact that I'm offering this type of experience? Is this in fact what they're looking for? So any thoughts on that, Michelle, as we close out today? I think it, it, it the <clears throat> Sounds like the mastermind really talked about knowing who you are and what your value is. And I think we talk about that a lot on this mastermind call is, 
You have to be able to answer the question when somebody says, why, why do I use you? And what, what do you do that's different than everybody else? And if, if you can't answer that off the cuff, practice until you can and find out what, what, and I also believe find something that attracts you as well and, and, and engages you. And I guess it's a better word, um, engages your mind because that's what I had to do. I had, a, I knew I can do Fannie and Freddie loans. I don't mind doing them, but I love doing the out of the box stuff because it's creative. It engages my mind and I love it. So I think that would be the, the footprint of getting outside your box, outside your comfort zone, um, finding what you love, do what you love. I mean, Darren talks about it all the time. The people that are successful don't do what they don't love. They do what right, they love. Yeah, right. Resonates. Because we, yeah, because you can handle that's What I loved about him, one of his things was he said, he goes, don't think that the people like that, you know, um, Bill Gates or, or just, you know, didn't have problems in his job. He goes, but he loved 95% of his job. So when that 5% that was awful and his job came up, he could handle, he was better equipped to handle it. And same thing with us. Find what you love, find your niche market your niche, become an expert at your niche and bring value to your database and to your realtors. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I mean, that's why, you know, getting back to the, you know, my mine with VA jumbo and it's great when it's a VA jumbo, right? <laughs> right? But, there, but oh, yeah. there's a story, I mean, there's a story behind why I like to do that. I'm sure just as a, there's a story behind why you like to, and, you know, same with the investors, you know, being a real estate investor, uh, that I have a passion for that. I'd rather do that than I would like than than doing a first time home buyer. I mean, that that's just my preference. Now, if it's a via a veteran, well, that's a whole other deal. You know, of course, I want to help them. But um, it's funny because, you know, <laughs> there's a there's another coach out there in just generic space. And and she has um, her website's called Client Attraction. And she said, you know, if you like peanut butter cookies, then find other people that like peanut butter cookies. You know, not everybody's going to like peanut butter cookies. That's okay. But your job is to sell the hell out of peanut butter cookies. Right. And, um, and I'm going, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. We have to figure out what it is that we love and what our passion is so that we can drive with that. And I think it'll resonate through everything that we've talked about these level four relationships, being a partner, um, you know, the client appreciation events that we just talked about, whether you take photos, whether you answer questions about, um, you know, that deep, that daily digital deep dive, um, whether you want to provide an experience that's like McDonald's or that's like something more high end, you know, your niche, uh, just everything that we do has to do with finding our passion and figuring out what our why is. And that, you know, if you've been in, through the process of, of Darren Hardy and, and the um, insane productivity, go back to it. It's perfect time of the year to do it. It's halftime. We all need to go into the locker room and assess whether we're winning or losing the game, figure out what our strategies are going to be that we're going to change, you know, as we get to the end of the second quarter um, and make sure that we're out there with the passion and the why, because it's going to resonate with everybody um, as we move forward. So hopefully, um, and I, I wish Dave would have been on the call because he was at this too, and I'm sure he picked up something really you know, different than what I did. So maybe we'll talk about it a little bit again next week to make sure that we cover and share as much as we possibly can with everybody. But uh, Michelle, is there any parting thoughts you want to give us as we close? Happy Friday. <laughs> that's what I'll say. <laughs> that's it. Happy Friday. So that's it, guys. That's a wrap. And we'll, um, we'll catch you next week. I hope you all have a great week. And hopefully you can put some of what you heard into play. And if you have further questions, give us a call. We'll talk to you later.